with Demetrius Johnson, John Jones, Anderson Silva, GSP. When we talk about the greatest MMA fighters, the same names appear every time. Connor, Connor is the GOAT. Yeah. John Jones is the GOAT. Khabib is, you know, one of them. He smashed everybody. He, there's never been a guy like him. That guy made no. it to undefeated as a world champion. And you don't put GSP at number one, I'm out. Title defenses, how good they were at their prime, and popularity among fans are the things people usually consider when they rank their favorite fighters. However, one of the most overlooked skills is longevity, and no other fighter embodies this skill more than Donald Cowboy Cerrone. I'm just a fucking hillbilly that's good at fighting. From his classic bouts under the World Extreme Cage Fighting banner to his triumphant finishes in the UFC. Most wins in UFC history, baby! Cerrone has time and time again challenged himself against the very best in the world. The list of killers he's fought is insane, truly ridiculous. Ask anyone in the MMA world about Cowboy, and no doubt, most will tell you that the man is an absolute badass. I'm a professional alcoholic. <laughs> But not too many people know the story of how he started off in the fight game. On paper, Cowboy wasn't supposed to be the success story that he is today. But unconventional journeys lead to extraordinary destinations. Born in Denver, Colorado in 1983, Donald Cerrone was diagnosed with an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder as a child. But he never received any treatment for it, as his grandfather, who was a doctor himself, discarded the diagnosis and the bottle of pills that accompanied it calling it a waste paper basket disease. As you can imagine, this resulted in Donald having all sorts of issues in school, with most teachers and adults labeling him as a problematic child. Things only got worse with time, leading to a troubled adolescence, plagued by frequent bouts of street fighting with the occasional police encounter. Not long after he entered high school, his parents divorced, with neither parent in a position to take care of their son, whose behavior ranged from rambunctious to unlawful. Donald moved into his grandparents' home, who showed him unconditional love. Interviewed by Sports Illustrated, his grandmother would later say, if some of the things he did were to test our love, then he was wasting his time, because I was on his side whatever he did. The toughest and most expensive tests for the Cerrones frequently came in the dead of night when the phone would ring. The calls came from jails in nearby towns. It was Donald, asking his grandparents to bring some cash to bail him out. My grandparents loved me more than anything, man, and if I wanted something, I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be a magician. So they uh, bought me all the magic stuff. and Their unconditional love provided stability, but still no direction for their grandson as adulthood approached. He tried getting construction jobs and attempted a career as a professional bull rider. No, they were like the most supportive people I've ever met in my life. So if I wanted to be a bull rider, they were there at practice. They were there for all the rides. It was insane. Like I would just look out and there they'd be sitting there watching, you know? And However, when at age 20, he followed a friend to a Colorado kickboxing dojo, Donald immediately felt at home. I loved it. It was like a time in my life where if I could go back, that's I would love to go back and go to the kickboxing days. After a short stint with Freedom Fighters Gym, he made the transition to the Jackson Wink MMA Academy, training alongside legends like the aforementioned John Jones and George St. Pierre. Feeling he had finally found his place in the world, he decided to pursue a career as an MMA fighter. The road ahead was unclear, but Cowboy was all in. So my grandpa bought me a house up in Vail, Colorado, and moved me up there and, and hired a black belt to live with me, and we trained three times a day. Oh, wow. Yeah, three times a day, boom, 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 boom. In the summer of 2006, a Colorado fight promoter offered Cowboy $5,000 to fight in a Ring of Fire event. Cowboy didn't hesitate. He tore through the Ring of Fire circuit, winning his first four bouts with first round submissions. He then leveled up, signing a contract with the iconic, now defunct, World Extreme Cage Fighting, and kept making a name for himself, picking up impressive victories that showcased an extensive striking background. His grandparents traveled wherever, whenever they could, to be cage side at Cowboys fights. They traveled around the world with me. I fought in Japan, there they were, you know, and um, everybody needs somebody like that, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody needs like a strong family or a father figure to, to be there for your kids' little league game or be there for soccer game or if you're in spelling contest, you know, whatever, whatever it may be that you're there, be that parent that's proud standing around like, that's my boy, yeah, that's my girl. 
But as Donald fought inside cages, his grandfather staged his own battle against a far more frightening opponent, cancer. Years later, Donald would say at one point, his grandfather promised him not to die until he had made it into the UFC. Between 2009 and 2010, Donald fought twice against all-time great Benson Henderson for the interim, and later the undisputed World Extreme Cage Fighting Lightweight title. While the first bout was a close affair, with many fans at the time quick to label a decision in favor of Henderson, a robbery for Cowboy, the second fight saw Henderson produce a finish via guillotine choke within two minutes of the first round. While this would certainly not be the last time he would fight for a world title, the latter of these bouts would mark a consistent pattern in Cerrone's fighting career, his tendency to be defeated in the biggest moments of his career. As the year 2010 slipped into 2011, so too did Cowboy's grandfather's health. He had to be placed in a hospice, needing 24 hours assistance. Shortly after, fearing his death was imminent, he asked to speak with Donald alone. I don't know how much longer I can hang on, he famously told his grandson, so try to get into the UFC. And in the words of Cowboy himself, right then his cell phone rang. It was the UFC, asking if he'd take a short notice fight against Paul Kelly. You accepted this fight on short notice. I was actually in the hospital. I, when they gave me the call, my grandpa was up there really sick, and I, uh, I, I, took, I, I said, yeah. He said, go, go do what you have to do, and, and I showed up. As he walked towards the cage, Cowboy was informed that his grandfather had slipped into a coma. By the end of the match, which saw him winning with a rear naked choke, his grandfather had died. He just passed away. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. It's all right. Did you dedicate this to him? Yeah, definitely. Is he a big part of your life? Um, you know, obviously. And this is how Cowboy's iconic UFC run began, with a four-fight winning streak, including a TKO victory over Charles Oliveira. Donald Cowboy Cerrone! That's a fuck However, his first real test in the UFC would eventually arrive in his fifth bout. In the form of a Stockton veteran, and fan favorite, Nate Diaz in late 2011. Diaz was already an established UFC talent by this point, and leading up to the fight, used a myriad of trash talking, taunts, and physical altercations to anger his opponent. But I'm not trying to be a bully, I'm just trying to, you know, do what I gotta do to survive in this UFC, MMA type of game. Perhaps most famously, knocking Cerrone's cowboy hat off his head during the pre-fight press conference stare down. Hey, hate me, love me, I don't care, we're fighting. As the pair stepped into the cage, rather than touch gloves, Cowboy raised a middle finger towards his opponent. Clearly Diaz's mind games had worked. Cerrone was so consumed by the anger he felt in the weeks before the bout, that during the first round he seemed distracted, and basically remained a near stationary target, standing right in front of Diaz, swinging for the fences, and absorbing punch after punch. Although he found his rhythm in the latter two rounds, the damage had already been done, and Diaz claimed the decision. Nate! Let's just move forward and keep it, keep it dug, you know? And uh, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was just easier that way. Yeah, it's just exhausting. Following this defeat, Cerrone would go 4-2 in his next six bouts, between 2012 and 2013 with the two losses coming from future UFC champions, Anthony Pettis and Rafael Dos Anjos. Cerrone's carefree personality, his endearing cowboy persona, and his exciting fighting style were quickly marking him out as a fan favorite and a serious contender. Mixing some slick Muay Thai with some savvy wrestling, he would embark on an eight-fight win streak that included tapping out striking wizard Edson Barboza, a brutal head kick KO over Jim Miller, a unanimous decision sweep against future UFC champion Eddie Alvarez, 30 seconds. and the avenging of his two previous losses against Benson Henderson. Although the fight with Henderson wasn't especially exciting, the win was massive on his record and moved him closer to a title shot. Keep in mind, he accepted that fight on a 15 days notice, and against a fighter he'd already lost to twice. A focused Donald Cerrone is a dangerous Donald Cerrone. Donald Cerrone does it again! A true warrior who really put his life on the line whenever he stepped in the octagon. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the... In December 2015, he was given the opportunity to avenge another previous loss 
against Rafael dos Anjos to get a shot at the lightweight crown. I don't see this fight going five rounds. Riding an eight-fight win streak, many believed Cowboy had this one in the bag. Unfortunately, early in the fight, Dos Anjos landed a picture-perfect body kick, and Cerrone never recovered. He attempted to create distance, but was quickly overwhelmed with Dos Anjos' seemingly endless combination of punches, before being grounded and TKO'd in the first round. He did a great job overwhelming me and, and doing what he had to do to remain champ. So, like I said, you, sometimes you just don't show up, and in our profession, it's, it's a bad day. This reinforced the growing idea that Cowboy struggled to perform when it really mattered. In February 2016, Cerrone would defeat Alex Oliveira Cowboy! in a move to the welterweight division. Man, you got big fans everywhere we go. You lit up Following the success at his new weight class, he would secure two more TKO victories before finding himself facing off against Matt Brown. Cerrone is best known as a jovial competitor during fight week, opting for smiles, handshakes and hugs, rather than intense stare-downs and getting into verbal altercations with his opponents. However, Brown refused to play that game and was unusually hostile toward Cowboy before the fight, accusing him of being a fraud and a bully. I just, uh, kind of a bully, I think, you know, kind of a, um, he reminds me of like a senior in high school picking on the freshman, you know, just thinks he's like kind of above everybody and, you know, it's just not the type of person that I really like to associate myself with and not the type of person that I like being part of our sport. So, you know, he's not an honorable, respectful martial artist. The root of Brown's hostility wasn't exactly clear, but Cowboy, having learned his lesson from the Diaz fight, bit his tongue and stayed focused. Once the fight came about, Cowboy added to a streak of three welterweight knockouts in a row, knocking Brown out cold with a thunderous head kick. Boom! Perfect! Right on the jaw! A brutal finish to an equally brutal fight. Correct! Perfect! Knowing it was done, and proving to be a class act, he stood over Brown and refused to land unnecessary ground and pound on his fallen foe. He hit a lot harder and it was a lot more durable than I expected him to be. However, Cerrone's Cinderella march through the welterweight division stopped abruptly in 2017 when he met Jorge Masvidal. So I'm hoping the best cowboy comes out. I'm hoping he's had that psychologist spitting game in his ear for however long he's needed him. I want the best cowboy that's ever lived. Cowboy came into the bout ranked number five in the UFC's official welterweight rankings, and this was a good chance to establish himself as one of the weight class's top contenders. The crowd inside Denver's Pepsi Center clearly favored Cerrone, who was born in that town, but that seemed to matter little to the Miami-born Masvidal, who greeted the jeers from the fans with a confident smirk. They love me here. Why do you think that is? Because I'm good looking. Duh. During the opening round, both men scored solid strikes. Title shot. Hard leather exchange in the pocket there. With just seconds remaining in the first round, Masvidal uncorked a vicious combination that sent Cerrone crashing to the mat. As referee Herb Dean swooped in to stop the punishment, the horn also sounded to declare the end of the round. Herb Dean comes in and stops the fight! Or is that the end of the round? Stand by. Dean declared that match was still on and allowed Cerrone to get back to his corner. Hats off to Cabo for even getting up because I looked right into his soul when he got up and he wasn't there. And when he came out, he wasn't there, so he's a warrior. Unfortunately, things got worse in the second round. Just as Cerrone tried to land a combination, Masvidal sent him back down to the canvas and unleashed a hellish string of punches until the referee finally stepped in. Jorge Gamebred Masvidal! A war with Robbie Lawler followed, adding another loss to Cowboy's record. his first consecutive loss in his professional career. An astounding feat in retrospect, given the strength of his resume. Cerrone looked to break this unfortunate spell of bad luck against the then rising prospect Darren Till. Unfortunately, Till found an opening early in the fight and did not relent until he won via TKO. For Till, this was a breakout moment. While he was undefeated in his four UFC fights before this one, Cerrone was the first big name and main event caliber fight. So to get the win in such a convincing fashion was a strong statement. Yeah, 
We're gonna have a beer. You're gonna. You promise yes. me a beer. We're gonna have a beer. Okay. Thank Good you. job. Cheers. Good luck in your Thank career. You. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. You got it, man. See you later. At the start of 2018, Cerrone would get back into the winning column, defeating Yancey Medeiros. After both fighters traded big punches in the closing seconds of round one, Cerrone caught Medeiros with a looping left hook behind the head and the perfect right cross on the chin to floor him. A series of hammer punches forced the quick stoppage. It was, however, the incredible sportsmanship shown by both that nearly stole the headlines. After Cerrone kneeled down to help his opponent and hug him, Mideros shot up to his feet and leaped over the cage to deliver an emotional embrace to Cerrone's grandmother, who was standing cage side, who still showed love and support to her grandson. Thank you so much for taking this fight, and thank you so much for, like, fighting. It was cool. I've never seen anyone get knocked down, and he stood up and goes, you mother right. What a solid dude. This win would land Cerrone a fight against Leon Edwards. This may have been Edwards' first ever UFC main event, but he showed no trace of nerves as he dominated both in the clinch and at distance. His southpaw stance, superb timing, and rapier-like punches proved a nightmare for the American veteran early on. Ultimately, Edwards earned a dominant decision victory, with many wondering if Cowboy had now entered the final stage of his career. Man, he did great. These new up-and-coming guys, they're, they're, they're so well-rounded, you know, where when I first started, there, you were a striker, or you were a wrestler, or you were a grappler, and, and now these guys are so triversed, man. It's crazy coming in, and it's, it's awesome, man. I love where the sport's going, and like I said, I'm, I'm going to stay here and keep fighting until they tell me I can't anymore, until the kids just wash me down until I can't. So, um... Cerrone would find some success against newcomer Mike Perry, securing an armbar finish. To then make his lightweight return against Alexander Hernandez. I just see myself facing an insecure little lad swinging on a saddle with a pop gun and a feather in his hat. Hernandez was arrogant and disrespectful to a fault leading up to their clash. Yeah, I look great. You look like you've served the last two terms in the fucking Oval Office. You look worn out. You look aged and withered. Labeling cowboy an old man, fighting for the wrong reasons. I'm in this. I know why. I know my purpose. I know my mission. And I've, I'm 100% committed to one thing. I'm like old day drinking Don over there who's got mixed mistresses. I focus on one thing and one thing only. I know I'm going to be a champion. Accusations of mixed mistresses and questioning Cerrone's heart all played a role in Hernandez's scheme to replicate the Diaz battle plan to mess with Cerrone's mindset. But instead of falling for his tricks, Cerrone put up a performance that became a dark cloud that hangs over Hernandez to this day. Oh. It was measured and a brutal one. Hernandez looked to capitalize on Cerrone's known weakness, early aggression. And while he had some success, Cowboy weathered the storm, punishing Hernandez's sloppy and wild entries, with wicked body knees to slow the young prospect down. Finally, a head kick followed by a malicious ground and pound announced Cerrone's return to lightweight in a thunderous fashion. The old man still got it. He would follow that with a dominant decision victory against Al Iaquinta, making himself a relevant figure in the title picture once more. Is he getting old? Well, he showed that he's not. I think this guy can still go on for a, at least a few more years. Not bad for a day drinking dawn, huh? Damn. In 2019, in a fight billed as the people's main event, he faced off against Tony El Kukui Ferguson, a man many had dubbed the uncrowned champion of the lightweight division. Donald Cerrone and you make for a spectacular matchup. The crowd was in a frenzy as the bout began. Oh and Cerrone and Ferguson quickly showed the casuals why. The best way to describe a Ferguson or a Cerrone fight is savagery. They fought with little regard to their own bodies, as if all that mattered was doing as much damage to the other guy as possible. Donald's having a problem with that nose, he keeps touching it. Cerrone is like a force of nature, and he's used to winning fights by willing himself to walk through the fire until his opponent fizzles in the face of pressure. But in Ferguson, he was fighting a mirror image of himself. These boys are going at it. El Kukui was like Chinese water torture, a relentless drip after drip attack. There was never any release. Tony just never stops. At the end of round two, unexpectedly, 
things went horribly wrong. Ferguson landed a punch clearly after the bell, resulting in a hard warning. What's worse, however, is that after that punch, Cowboy blew his nose. Because his nose was broken, the air he tried to blow out was instead trapped in his sinus cavity, inflating and almost exploding his right eye. Cerrone blew his nose in the corner, and Cerrone's lucky both of his eyes didn't shut when he did that. Um, you know, it sucks. What are you going to do? As a ringside doctor examined what would later be ruled out as a broken orbital bone, Cerrone would not be allowed to step back into the octagon for the third round. His eye was completely shut, and his obviously broken nose, swollen and puffy. This rendered him medically unable to continue. I think when he blew his nose over there, he can't do that. It was a disappointing end to the fight, and it caused fans to throw things into the octagon. But Dana White's take was that the referee handled the ending properly, and that Ferguson had won the fight fair and square. No, Tony won that fight. Tony won the fight fair and square. It is what it is. Despite the anticlimactic conclusion, Cowboy was still riding a tidal wave of fan hype, and then he felt he had provided a good account of himself against Ferguson, one of the very best on the planet. Cerrone quickly found himself back in the mix against Justin Gaethje. I'm okay with the worst possible outcome, and that's how I do it. My family will love me no matter what, so. How do you feel? Man, I feel good. I get to go do what I love. Cowboy will not see a friendly or a familiar face. I'm going in there. He's going into, he will be walking into a war zone tomorrow. Although Cowboy landed some decent jabs earlier in the round, a huge right hand hook soon sunk him to the ground. Gaethje continued pummeling while staring at the referee, urging him to end the fight for the welfare of Cerrone. This marked the third fight in the row in which Gaethje had managed to dispose of an opponent in a single round. Edson Barboza and James Vick being his previous victims. What a cool sport. Tomorrow I wake up and I get to go fight again, man. I love my job. So, uh, Justin, roof shoulders, man. I would, I would like to announce to the public the return of the notorious Conor McGregor will take place on January 18th in the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. So that is my comeback fight. It is 12 weeks this Saturday. In January of 2020, Conor McGregor ended his sabbatical and returned into the octagon at UFC 246. Well done, everybody. Well done. Cerrone was the chosen opponent. This is the fight I wanted. This is the f I'm not complaining at all, man. I'm here to have a good time. My Connor said we're entertainers, man, so we're here to entertain, blow the roof off this. Both men agreed to forego the lightweight class and instead compete at welterweight. Surprisingly, this fight would end up lasting just 40 seconds. After clinching in the opening seconds, McGregor landed a succession of unique shoulder strikes, which visibly damaged Cerrone's nose. A neatly disguised left high kick came next, followed by a barrage of unanswered blows. Toppled and beaten, Cerrone shelled up and waited for the inevitable conclusion. While many may have picked McGregor to get the win prior to the bout, few could have predicted such a swift finish against such a seasoned veteran. Couldn't get going, couldn't get excited, couldn't get fired up, didn't want to be there. Biggest fight, all the attention, my time to shine, I didn't want to be there. It was crazy, man. And I don't know why, I don't know how, I don't know how to change that, but uh, it sucks, man. Sometimes I show up there, I'm ready, I'm fired up, and I'm ready to go. Sometimes I get there, and I'm like, man, I don't even want to be here, so don't know. Cowboy would go on to fight Anthony Pettis in May of the same year, at UFC 249. The striking on display by both men was simply world-class. Both men landed significant strikes right until the final bell, with Cowboy landing a trademark high kick. Despite his strong showing, however, this was not enough for the judges, who gave the decision to Pettis. Pettis himself reacted in surprise, and many considered this to be a robbery for Cowboy. 
who would then move on to a match against Nico Price that resulted in a disappointing draw. In early 2021, although it was clear for many that it was time for Cerrone to retire, he fought newcomer Alex Morono. Both fighters were scoring early, but Morono was inflicting the harder shots, ultimately landing a beautiful right hand, followed by a heavy combination and the eventual finish. This game uh, can get changed. All it takes is one big shot. He hit me with a good one, tipped me back, hit me with another good one. I hear my coach saying, grab a hold of him. It's like, man, I don't know if I could take three of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Dana White told the media it was time for him and Cowboy to have a talk about the future, with the tone of the CEO hinting that the conversation would not be a pleasant one. Soon enough, it was announced that Cerrone would be allowed one last fight under the promotion and was paired against Jim Miller once more, a man he had knocked out with an iconic head kick some eight years prior. Despite Cowboy's good performance, and one incredibly close head kick that nearly recreated their first bout perfectly, Miller would find a guillotine choke in round two, bringing a close to Cerrone's in-ring life. But unlike so many retirement scenes inside the octagon, no part of Cerrone seemed bitter or melancholic. Thank you, Las Vegas. <laughs> With a smile on his face, he told Joe Rogan he knew it was time to leave. I don't love it anymore, Joe. He laid down his iconic Stetson, placed his gloves inside, gave his fans a happy, contented smile, and so concluded one of the greatest careers in MMA history. Donald Cerrone is undoubtedly a first ballot Hall of Famer and an icon of MMA, with a resume that is unmatched in terms of white hot matchups. Most wins in UFC history, baby! And most finishes in UFC history. Across two divisions, Cerrone remained a relevant contender, providing more highlight reel combinations, finishes, and wins than any other fighter could likely only dream of. Most wins, most finishes, most post fight bonuses. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter if his name is often overlooked when talking about the best fighters of all time. What Cerrone has accomplished extends beyond wins and losses. A certified legend, this guy is pure class. Simply put, they don't make them like Cowboy anymore. That's why I wanted a, uh, a fan, a sold out crowd to walk out that tunnel blow the roof off this place and look over and see my son like, wow, dad. Whoa, nothing's gonna 